Today on Whistle Talk, we're going to blow the lid off the world of football officiating. Today we have a special guest joining us. He is none other than George Dimitrio, the mastermind behind the writing study guides for the NFHS and college football rules. We're about to dive into the intricacies of officiating football games, so grab your striped shirt and your rulebook because you won't want to miss this enlightening conversation with one of the leading authorities in our game. That's coming up next on Whistle Talk. Are you a football fan? Have you ever found yourself wondering what in the world was that ref thinking? Well, Mike D, the referee, is here to help. Join me on Whistle Talk as I talk to professionals on the field and in the booth to help you understand what is going on inside the mind of a football official. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on Whistle Talk, and today we got a special guest with us, the author of the Reading Study Guide, the NFHS Rules Guide. Let me uh, kind of show it up here for those people who aren't familiar with it. Uh, we got Mr. George Demetrio with us. Okay, he has been uh, well a pioneer with with this book, and and for some people, some officials, they consider this to be the uh, the holy grail for officiating and helping clarify the rules and, and making everything a little bit simple. Um, so George has been, uh, George has come onto our show today. He's got a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. He is still the uh, rules interpreter for the Colorado Football F Officials Association. Am I correct in saying that, George? Sure. Okay. So uh, he's got a little PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go through some of the rules and clarify some of the rules for everybody out there. So with that said, uh, Mr. George Demetrio, thank you once again for joining us. Yo, thank you for having me. So here we go with the PowerPoint. Let's start this from the beginning. All right. So with the PowerPoint, we're going to talk about today some officiating standards, talking about holding, uh, some blindside blocks, horse collar tackling, roughing the kicker, and face mask fouls. Um, and for those people at home who are just listeners only, you will be able to see this whole video in PowerPoint on YouTube. So it'll be uploaded onto YouTube uh, later on today. All right, George, you want to take over from here or you want me to keep going? Okay, so uh, if you can uh, put up the agenda. Okay, so as Mike said, uh, these are the topics I'm going to uh, cover today. Uh, my selections are based on the so-called officiating standards, which are uh, in the uh, NCAA rulebook, uh, but have not yet made it to the uh, to the National Federation rulebook. Uh, we hope to get something along those lines done in the next few years. But uh, these used to be called philosophies. And the problem with philosophies is uh, coaches did not understand or would not accept stuff that was not in the rule book. So the uh, NCAA uh, solved the problem by putting them in the rule book and relabeling them as officiating standards. So as high school officials, uh, we cannot make the same mistake. Uh, we can be guided by these standards, but it really is not a good idea to cite the standards as the basis for a, a call. I think okay. you'll see as we go through them that uh, they're, they're pretty much uh, common sense. So as long as you understand where where these come from, and, and not everything I'm going to say uh, has its basis in the officiating uh, standards, some of them are directly out of the high school rules. So uh, we'll just uh, point those out as we go along. Uh, if you'll flip All the right. slide. So our, the NCAA rule book, no more philosophy. There's 78 different topics in the rule book, including it, spotting it, the ball. It, it didn't. Okay, so I already covered uh, this. Uh, you can see some of the topics uh, in the 78 items that they cover. So enough on that. Let's just go right to holding. 
Okay, and these these are in fact uh, uh, NCAA uh, standards, and uh, they're not all the standards that the NCAA has, but I picked out five that are definitely applicable uh, to high school football. So the first one says that if, if a player is illegally blocked and the block pushes him into tackling the runner, there's no point in calling a foul on, on that play. Uh, yep. The play was not affected whatsoever. The second one uh, requires a little bit more judgment. Uh, the, the concept of this is that if the offense is willing to dedicate two players to block one defender, uh, we are not going to worry about uh, technical holding. And the exception to that is if the defender uh, breaks the double team block and is subsequently pulled down, then a flag would be appropriate. But we don't want to get overly technical when we have two on one blocking. Okay. Uh, the other one is one that most of us wish made it in directly into the rule book, and that is if there's no restriction as a result of the technical blocking violation. In other words, if it's away from the point of attack, then we don't want a flag there either. Yep. The quarterback sack, uh, again, is, uh, is another one that's highly uh, subject to judgment. Uh, if the defender is, uh, is held and he breaks the hole and sacks the quarterback, then we probably should not have a foul on that. Uh, if there's a time element between the hole and and the sack, that's a different story. You got to apply judgment to that. Okay. And then you also got to be careful uh, if there is a, a, a foul by the defense on the play and you're your flag for the hold would have caused the fouls to offset. So yep. there's quite a bit of judgment there, and that belies the importance of not having shotgun flags. Okay? And the, yep. the last one I want to cover is obvious and intentional takedowns, uh, particularly those that are wide open uh, and visible to everyone in the stadium, those need to be called from the standpoint of credibility, even if they had no impact on the play. And we're gonna to go to some clips and that'll be the first clip that we illustrate, okay? And for, for the listeners out there that aren't in the, in the football officiating world, the, the lay person, when you say shotgun flag, you're, you're talking about throwing it right away uh, as opposed to taking a second to let it marinate for a second, make sure you're seeing what you're seeing. Is that correct? Yes. That, that's what yep. I meant with exactly what I meant with a shotgun flare. Yep. Yeah. It's something that we, as a crew, our particular crew, we talk about making sure that we see it, let it resonate. Did you process it in your mind before you throw that flag? So here we go with our first clip. It's uh Okay, so right. on this clip, we're going to watch the right tackle. That's a nice tackle. So again, for those people that are able to watch it at home, it's a little bit of a counter play here. We've got a crisscross action going, and the right tackle basically – who becomes at the point of the attack because of the counter motion. Old school uh, wing T action has a nice tackle on the defensive end there. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So yeah, let's just... go on to the, the next clip. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and play it. In this one, we're looking at uh, A67, and he gets his arms outside his torso and turns the defender. 
So, so A67 um, in this video, not, I just paused it, is the center. And as he gets beat, <clears throat> his arms are completely outside the, the framework of the body. Right. But although, again, although it's an illegal blocking technique, there is no material district of restriction, and we would not want to see a flag on this. Nope. And in essence, too, the defender kind of took himself out of the play, too, with, with their, their action. The defender kind of slanted away from the point of the attack. So he basically took himself fully out of the play, too. So. All okay. right. And that's an excellent lead in to the next clip, because in the next clip, we're going to look at the left tackle and we're going to note that the defender takes an inside charge and the runner goes outside. So even though the left tackle's arm comes out and the defender gets spun around, uh, he really took himself out of the play and had no chance of making the tackle. And uh, nonetheless, there was a flag there that should have been thrown. All right, so left tackle number 78. I'll let it go one more time here. So shotgun, pretty much a sweep off tackle to the left side. So now, George, on that one, because he did take that inside charge that you were talking about, the play wasn't too far outside, and a good enough defender would have had an ability, and this actually, this defensive end did get into the end of the tackle. So I think that's why you got the flag on that one. Yeah, I guess that's why he threw the flag. Uh, but we would have been happy with the no call on this one. Okay. Okay, and then the last uh, holding clip, uh, the, the right guard pulls and extends his arm. And again, uh, there's really no material uh, restriction here. Uh, rewind it. Yep. Yeah, that's a that's a good no call. We got a little counter action going with the guard and tackle pulling. Guard kind of kicks out, but misses them. But again, underneath the play. All right, okay, some good so clips. That, that's that's what I wanted to show you guys on holding. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is blindside blocks. And uh, here big, we, big get, controversy. We, we get away from the officiating standards business and directly into the high school rule. Okay. And there's two things that are important to note when making a call on a blindside block. And I want to be very careful to point out that there are legal blindside blocks and illegal blindside blocks. So be very careful about uh, saying that just because it was a blindside block, it was illegal. There is a distinction there. And what I'm going to try to do here in the next few minutes is help you distinguish between the legal blocks and the illegal blocks. So there's two things that you need to note for a blindside block. And by the way, uh, blindside blocks primarily happen when there is an abrupt change of direction. Yep. Uh, a runner going around the end and uh, finds that that side is sealed off. So he deviates from the playbook and turns around and runs the other way. Uh, designed reverses would be the same thing, uh, interceptions, and punt returns. Those are all prime scenarios for blindside blocks. So the yep. two things that we have to look for are the view of the player being blocked. Was he able to see the blocker approaching him? And there are a lot of nuances to that, which I'll get into in a subsequent slide. The second 
thing that we need to note is the type of contact. Is it with the shoulder? Is it with the hands? And was it forcible? Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at the details for view. Okay. So the main question is, did the blocker, uh, did the bl player being blocked see the blocker's approach? Uh, All right. So here we go with our first okay. clip, and we got a end zone oh. view here of a punt return. Right. And we will see the illegal blindside block right at the goal line. All right. So the punt goes over the returner's head all the way back to the goal line. And now we got ourselves a little bit of a broken play, and bam, there it is. Now, I could tell everybody at home right now, we got ourselves what looks to be about an 80-yard punt return on the play, and we're going to have some very unhappy coaches because they're going to say that, oh, I can't believe you threw that flag and uh, you just took away an 80-yard punt return, special teams being the biggest momentum change out there. But that one, that hits all the checklists right there. Okay, so let's just go on uh, and look at this one. Uh, and on this play, we'll see it right at the end of the play. Uh, it is an interception return. Uh, it is a blindside block, but it is legal because he uses his hands. All right. So it looks like we got a spread formation here. Quarterbacks in shotgun. Calling the cadence. Drops back to pass. And there's the interception. He's returning it. All right, there's the blind side block, but with the open hands, as you were talking about. So, oh, here's the secondary view again. Fast forward it a little bit. Should be able to get a really good angle on this one. So the quarterback basically just chucks up the ball, and now he got a sideline return. And this is, again, where you're talking about... <clears throat> The block was made by the offensive lineman. Looks like on another defensive lineman, but he used his open hands. So that's what would distinguish it between not being a blindside block as opposed to being the shoulder blow. And uh, the old school style, when I was uh, growing up playing football and the highlight reels that we watch on uh, NFL films of the lower and the boom on somebody, that kid basically got shoved to the ground. Okay, so we can now move on to horse collar tackles, and we can call this slide Horse Collar Tackle 101. There are three elements to a horse collar tackle, and they all have to be there for the foul to be called. Mm -hmm. The first is the grip. The defender has to grip the inside of the back or the side of the collar of the runner, or he needs to grip the nameplate area. If the grip is down on the top of the number, that is too low to uh, reasonably create the injury that this foul is designed to protect against. So we do not want a horse collar tackle when the grip is as low as the top of the number. We also do not want to foul when the grip is on the shirt sleeve, okay? Mm -hmm. And obviously, anything lower than those is not a foul. That's the first element. If he doesn't grip them in one of those designated spots, we can immediately eliminate uh, a foul for a horse collar tap. The second thing that has to take place is he has to use that grip to pull the runner. Doesn't matter whether he pulls him backwards or sideways, but he has to pull him. And then the third element is he has to use that pull to put the runner to the ground. So grip, pull to the ground. 
If all those three things are not there, we do not have a foul. And I have just one clip on that, which will illustrate uh, those three elements as the official watched and kept the flag in his pocket. So now, George, to, to ask a question on this, and, and a lot of coaches will question us on the field about this. If the ball carrier is grabbed by the inside of the collar, like you're referring to by the shoulder pads and the inside of the collar, but the ball carrier continued to go forward, and even though he was pulled, but he went to the ground and he fell forward as opposed to falling backwards, would you have a foul on that one? No. I had said that he has to pull yep. him sideways or backwards. Just yep. the grip and holding him is not a foul. Another variation of uh, off of what you said is if he grips the collar and slows him down and then somebody else comes in and tackles him, that also is not a horse collar tackle. Yep. So what the horse collar tackle is really trying to eliminate, and I love this rule as a former player myself, it's the knee injuries. It's it's the awkward pulls backwards where, where the knees are kind of getting buckled and or sideways where the knee is kind of get twisted and contorted in ways that it shouldn't get twisted and contorted. But if the ball carrier is still going forward and momentum's carrying them forward, you got to tackle. That's it. If you're enjoying today's show and you want to show your appreciation to Mike D, you can buy him a beer by clicking on the link in the show notes or go to buymeacoffee.com backslash Mike D the referee. And as always, make sure to click follow and give five stars. Thanks for listening. Cheers. All right. So, again, we got a little spread formation, a little uh, jet sweep pass coming across. And you got the inside grip. You got the pull down and you got the pull backwards. So you got all three right there. So that is textbook. All right, so here we go. Roughing the kicker. Okay, roughing the kicker. The exceptions. The main one is the contact is unavoidable because it is not reasonably certain that a kick will be made. What can cause that? Two things. The... Uh, Snap is muffed by the punter, and he's fumbling around trying to pick it up, or it goes over his head and he has to chase after it. So anything that's not a clean reception of the snap uh, is going to put a certain amount of doubt into whether or not a kick will be made. The other thing is when the punter catches the snap cleanly and runs with it, okay? In, in those cases, if we give the benefit of doubt to the defense and uh, we do not want to flag on those. The second That's one the is – go ahead. So that that's now the, the, the common rugby style kick that we've been seeing where the punter is catching it and the whole protection is kind of moving. If it's a right-footed kicker, kind of moving with them to the right and they're kicking the ball on the run because basically they are a runner at that point in time. And I know a lot of coaches are coaching the kids up. If you got grass in front of you, you're keeping going. You're, you're, you're going. It's In high school, you're not typically getting just a – kicker you're getting a player that's also now kicking or punting in this scenario so if the kid's an athletic kicker he's going to take off and keep going so in that sense he is still a runner and not a punter right and we got to be careful uh when it is a rugby style punter and they have a routine for example he catches the snap takes two snap steps and kicks it if that happens, then I, I would be more prone to look for a foul than mm -hmm. someone who takes the snap and runs uh, a differing number of steps every time, depending yep. on the approach of the defense. So you have to be able to use good judgment on, on those. 
The uh, the second item is uh, if the contact is unavoidable and the defense touches the kick near the kicker. So in this case, it has to be the same player that touches the kick. And because he was able to do his job and block the kick, he could not avoid uh, contacting the kicker. It does not apply when one guy blocks the kick and another guy clobbers the kicker. And it doesn't apply if the kicker gets clobbered and the kick gets blocked at the line of scrimmage. Okay. Okay. The third one is contact is slight and partially caused by the movement of the kicker. Uh, We'll see this when the defender takes an appropriate route uh, in front of the kicker to avoid hitting the kicker. And in his uh, in his miss uh, of the block on the kick, he falls to the ground in front of the kicker, and the kicker uh, comes into him. That is not a foul. And then the last one is obvious, uh, where the uh, R player is blocked into the kicker by a kicking team member. And Mm -hmm. surprisingly, that is very often missed because the referee is focusing on the ball to see if it's blocked and he's not doesn't have a wide enough view of what's going on with the blocking around with the kicker. Yep, so too much tunnel so vision. Those two exceptions to, to roughing the kicker. On the next slide, uh, I have some items that we need to look for during the play. The intent of the defender, how much effort was made to avoid uh, the contact? Uh, Was he trying to inflict punishment or was he making a sincere effort to block the ball? I already covered the actions of the kicker. And the last thing is we got to be aware of the kicker taking a dive uh, he, uh, in other words, he gets slightly contacted and he flops to the ground <laughs> like they do in in basketball. Uh, surprisingly, the, these are pretty easy to discern, discern because the football players never went to a drama class and they're not <laughs> very okay. But again, it's something when you see it, don't hesitate. Uh, to withhold the flag. All right. Okay, judgment. I'm not going to read all this to you, but uh, those are the characteristics of uh, roughing. The main one is uh, a hit against the plant leg. uh, And you can read the others. Yep. So hitting against the raised leg, but the plant leg that that's now putting the the kicker in a very susceptible position of getting hurt. If they can't come down properly, they're now really in a chance of uh, getting injured on that play. Yeah, and it's this is not written anywhere, but uh, if you have any doubt, go by the severity of the contact. Okay. The severity of the contact is a pretty good guideline for uh, distinguishing between roughing and and running into. Okay, on the next slide are the characteristics of running into. So it's just moderate contact, displaced, it does not endanger the kicker. And does not call if the snap, it's not called if the snap hits the ground, which we, you have already talked about. So it's the same scenarios, but it's just uh, now to the lesser degree. Okay. And then the, uh, the last judgment slide there are the characteristics of a no call. And some of those I've already uh, covered in detail. Yep. All right, so we got 
okay, uh, video so here of a no call. Two clips on roughing the kicker, and neither one of these uh, are a foul. In the first one, uh, it is definitely not apparent that he's going to make uh, the kick because the punter is uh, is running, and you'll note that the the dive that the defender takes is clearly designed to block the kick and is not an effort to inflict punishment on the kicker. But see for yourself. All right, so punting left to right on the screen. A little bit of the rugby style kick. All right, so we got the rugby style kick. Punter is going out to his right. Defender breaks through, extends and dives for the ball. And the follow through, the punter was going. His momentum took him into where the block blocker was going. So definitely a no call on that one. But punter got up, not looking too happy on that one. Let it go through one more time here. Uh, very good no call, in my opinion. Very good no call. All right, so the next one. And then our uh, last clip, uh, you'll note that the defender gets his hand on the kicker uh, before the kicker actually puts his foot on the ball. So we would not want to foul on this type of play either. So the... The punt actually, the, the, the punter actually muffed the snap a little bit, so he kind of drops it. And the defender comes in trying to tackle him, trying to play football in that scenario. With the punter heads up enough, he was still able to get the punt off. But again, that's not rough in the kicker. The contact was made before the punt actually happened. Punter was brought down to the ground, but still, it was a football play, not a, not, not a roughing play. There was no malicious intent to injure or anything like that. Looking to make a play on the ball. All right, face masks. Right. And then our uh, last topic for today is uh, face mask fouls. It's not just the face mask, it's any edge of the helmet opening, uh, the chin strap, or uh, the tooth or mouth protector attached to the face mask. Which, by the way, has actually happened, and it uh, it spurred a big fight. Uh, oh wow! And keep in mind that the rule change this year is that they're not supposed to have that uh, extra uh, mouthpiece uh, hanging from their face mask. So yep. if you get rid of those uh, uh, before the game, you reduce the amount of things that the defense can uh, can grab. And, and to clarify uh, with what you, George is saying on that is uh, it's been kind of popularized with the NFL and college kids today of just letting the mouth guard kind of just dangle out of their mouth. But a lot of them are still doing the safety precaution where they're keeping a second one in their mouth because we we had it happen this past year and where we stopped the play. And he's like, no, sir. And he pulled out a clear one from his mouth. He had, he had a mouth guard in. But a, it was clear, so we couldn't see it, but he still had that second one dangling. So. Okay, the next the next point, and I think this is the biggest issue that I see with face mask fouls, is simply touching the face mask is not a foul. And that's the problem with the five-yard face mask rule, which the higher levels uh, tried and both uh, discarded. Uh, but we still have it in the rule book, and it doesn't mean that it's a good idea to call it simply because it is very difficult to discern between a grasp and a touch, particularly on a night game with high school field light. Very difficult. <laughs> yes, sir. And my advice is leave it alone. Either you have 15 or you have nothing. 
Uh, the other guideline is watch for the head movement. Uh, just because there is head movement doesn't mean the face mask was grabbed, but the opposite is a good guideline. If there's no head movement, then he almost certainly did not have a grasp on the uh, on the helmet. So with that, uh, let's take a look at a uh, couple of... No, I have another slide there uh, on things to look for. Yep. The inadvertent right. slapping, that's not a foul. The head's going to turn when the he face mask gets uh, slapped, but there's no grip on the face mask. The head movement we talked about, uh, if the face mask was used as a handle, we definitely want a foul there and we possibly could have a flagrant foul. Okay. So that's another judgment that you have to make as to whether the foul was flagrant or not. So now George, okay, really quick for again the clips. For the uh for for the non officials that might be out there listening, you mentioned in the previous slide that any opening or any hole. So ear hole. Somebody grabs somebody by the ear hole. Face mask penalty. Correct? Oh, you're asking me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. I, I think it's difficult that somebody will get their fingers in the ear hole, but <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is a helmet opening. That is a helmet opening. And, and the second one that I have seen, because I do agree with you, I haven't seen the one in the ear hole, but what about now the back of the helmet? The back lip yeah, of the helmet in the back actually that's a good that's a good lead in to uh to uh the second clip so let's look okay. at the first clip and then we'll talk about that on the second clip So on the replay, you'll see that he never grasped a helmet opening. He actually pulled the helmet off with his wrist because the helmet was worn improperly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know if you're playing the audio or not, but the audio, uh, the announcers mock the referee for not calling what they believe is an obvious face mask foul but actually, it was a correct call. Uh, no, I, he never I agree. A helmet opening. Okay. And for those so, that, that can't truly see it, his forearm kind of came almost at the shoulder pad level and got underneath the helmet. And it was his forearm that kind of pulled the helmet off, like he just said. So there was no grasping, no pulling, no nothing. It, if anything, it kind of looked a little bit like a clothesline, but it wasn't. But it's just uh, how the, uh, the the look of it was. Yep. So the last clip that we have is uh, a foul, a phantom foul that was called because the referee thought that the back of the helmet was used to pull the runner down. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that the grip was uh, on the the top of the jersey and it's not a horse collar first of all the play happened before the horse collar tackle rule was in effect and even today uh he pushed him uh pushed him down forward not back pull backwards so there is no foul on this play but the flag was for pulling him down by the uh the back of the uh, back edge of the helmet Oh, looks like we're, there we go. Sorry about that. All right, so the quarterback scrambling. Oh, I, I, I missed a clip. It's uh, number number three is the one that I described. Okay, here it is. 
So a little toss sweep to the left. Oh, yeah. So what we have here, got a toss sweep going to the left. The back kind of lowers his shoulder into the defender, and the defender actually pulls the back forward on top of them. And like you said, hands are around the, basically the nameplate, but he's pulling them forward on top of himself. But I, I'm assuming the official here thought that he grabbed that back of the helmet that we were just referring to and pulled them down, which if it did happen, would have been a face mask penalty. But again, that's that judgment call and probably should have been uh, tucked away on that one. Right. And then if we want to go back to number two, which I had uh, skipped over, it looks like the hand uh, initially goes to the face mask, but you can see that the pull down was not by the helmet, but by the back of the jersey. Uh, and it, it it is somewhat difficult to see because of the quality and the angle of the video. But I find it very difficult to believe that uh, uh, the defender could have changed his grip in the brief moment that he spins the uh, runner around. Yep. Yeah, I'm just letting it replay a couple times. And it definitely looks like more of a jersey pull, but the quarterback kind of lowers his he own head. Try to sell the face mask, possibly. All right. All right. So I think that's all, right, all so with the that's clips. Uh, that's, what, that's what I have for today. I thank you all for uh, participating. So, George, I got one last question for you before I let you go. And, uh, again, for everybody out there, let me show the book here. We got the the Reading Study Guide, NFHS Football Rule Book. And you also do put together one for the NCAA level each and every year, too, correct? Correct. Now, this the, the one that I just held up is the 2023 version. So that was for this past football season. And each year it does get updated. Uh, so some questions that people have been throwing to me uh, on social media. It doesn't seem like there's many rule changes coming up this year. So can we expect a, uh, a full book this year or just uh, kind of an yeah, addendum to it? Uh, there's, a new, there's a new edition. Uh, we always try to do, uh, do a new edition because we have such a uh, high volume of new officials at the high school level every year. But frankly, there are uh, really no uh, there are really no no changes. So uh, to be honest, if you're a veteran and you have the 2023 edition, uh, save your money for 2025. Uh, <laughs> but for a new official, uh, new officials, there is a 2024 uh, edition. And this is a, a fantastic supplement to getting into your state association or the NFHS rule book. Uh, love the way that it actually kind of talks more football talk as opposed to the legalese that sometimes the rule book can do. It kind of breaks it down into a little bit more of a of a common conversational type of uh, speak as opposed to, again, the, the legal language that sometimes is in the rule book. Uh, so for all the newer officials that are out there, get in your rule book. Get in your mechanics book and definitely get into the writing study guide. Sit there, quiz yourselves, quiz each other. We actually use this as a crew pregame. We'll throw a couple of questions that we pull from uh, from this book out there. Um, so it is an incredible study guide and uh, resource that we have as football officials. So once again, George, I would like to uh, take the th time to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, fantastic episode, fantastic person, and. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. We, we truly appreciate you all across the country. So thank you once again. Oh, you're most welcome. And I'm glad I was able to do it. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Whistle Talk, where we unravel the fascinating world of football officiating. If you enjoyed today's discussion and want to stay in the loop with the latest insights, be sure to subscribe to Whistle Talk on your favorite podcast platform. Stay connected with us by following Whistle Talk on social media, where we share behind the scenes glimpses, updates, and engage with our incredible community of officiating enthusiasts. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. 
Just search for the words Whistle Talk. Your support means the world to the show, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, or suggestions for future episodes. Drop us a line through our website or message me on social media. I'm always eager to connect with the fellow fans and continue the conversation. Until next time, keep blowing the whistle on the untold stories and nuances of football officiating. Thanks for being part of the Whistle Talk family. This is Mike D., the referee, saying so long for now.